morning, everybody. It's such a privilege to be sharing, and it's quite an unusual experience for me because uh, I've got a congregation of one, very beautiful congregation of one. And um, so, uh, but this morning, uh, as I'm just thinking about what's going on in our nation and what's going on with individuals, I think what I want to share this morning which is overcoming in a time of crisis. And um, you don't need me to tell you that there are lots of crises around the place. Where I live in a retirement resort, there are at least five older people who are, and I'm thinking of two couples, husband and wife, who are in terrible health crisis right now. But, um, I trust this morning as I share with you that um, you're going to be encouraged and I'm actually going to give you some tools. I might even give you some homework as well. Um, whether you do it, um, I'm not the headmaster, that's up to you. But I want to start off this morning by reading uh, a scripture from John chapter 16 and verses 2 and 3. Jesus is speaking and he says, Behold, an hour is coming. And has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. And Jesus knows what's ahead of him. The cross is still to come, but he knows he's going to go through the cross. He's going to get die, bury, and he's going to rise again. The only one in history that's ever done that and then ascended back to his father. So um, I remember when the lockdown started, uh, that's right back in about April last year, I think it was. Uh, I was in the service here in the church and we were, the lockdown was coming a few days later and I um, kind of said in my heart, Lord, what about this? And um, there's no doubt in my heart, the Lord spoke to me and he said, the church is about to have the greatest opportunity it's ever had. And then last week, my daughter Shannon spoke a week and um, the word the Lord had given her a word, I think in a proud time of prayer, saying this about the new lockdown this is not a time of restriction but a time of miracles and as i thought about that i say yes lord that is what's going on a member of our family who is um, a single lady in about 50 i suppose living down at betty's bay does anybody know where betty bay betty's bay is in south africa it's down next to Hermanus. It's a holiday village. You're not going to find a job there. But um, we heard the other day, she's got a job. It's an online job with MTN. She's got to sit behind her computer and she's going to get paid to do that. And so um, then uh, a little while ago, during the lockdown again, there was, the, and, and this stays with me, it's just so amazing. Distance, I've settled it in my heart once and for all, is not a problem when you pray for people. Because a Bethel uh, team of young, fired up people sitting in California, 18,000 kilometers away, prayed for people here in Bloemfontein, in Hebron Church a month or so ago, who had problems of health, some quite serious problems. So they prayed for them, and in the next Sunday, we heard of three people come and testify of amazing healings that they had received. So take courage. Um, the Lord is not in lockdown. He's wanting to, to do something. And I've got a sneaking feeling that he's got a bit fed up with the church because they love to come and sit in their building and do nothing else. Now, I'm not trying to be critical there, but um, he wants us to get out. He said, no, we're locked down. No, your building's locked, so you've got to do something else. Okay? So, 
but just when I thought of Shannon's word last week, um, she spoke about David and Goliath. Now there was a crisis, a big crisis, two armies facing each other, and the suggestion was, I'm not going to go over the sermon again, but the suggestion was that there were serious consequences to the one who fought Goliath. But David had his story organized, and it was not how big Goliath is, but how big is my God? Hallelujah! And so um, uh, that was number one. So we've got to change focus. The problem is not the mountain. I heard the other day someone say, when God looks at your mountain, he sees a little pimple. So, I mean, really. And then, of course, um, uh, Shannon spoke about, um, shoot at your Goliath with stones of Scripture. That, and then, of course, um, she went on to say, take some time of, in praise and worship and just thank the Lord while you are in the situation. And so um, that's, that's um, Shannon's preach in a nutshell. And now I want to get on to what I'm going to say myself. There are some other words which describe the word overcome. That is to conquer, to defeat, to successfully deal with a problem. Okay? And as I was thinking about that, I got out my being of a slightly older age a generation, I didn't get onto my cell phone to see my um, uh, 15 different translations and all that. I um, got out my Strong's Concordance, which is a big fat book like this, um, which older people use. Um, the writing's a bit small, but nevertheless, and I looked up the word overcome, and I was so surprised about uh, what the word has got to say about it and so I want to get on to that and, and give you a scripture and uh, so here it is 1 John 5 and verse 4 says for whatever is born of God overcomes the world and this is the victory that has overcome the world our faith verse 5 goes a, a little bit further it says and who is the one Remember, I've got an audience, a congregation of one. And who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So I'm kind of, I wonder if you from time to time think of the fact, I've got to work up my faith, I need more faith. But the condition is, if you've been born of God, in other words, you've been supernaturally born again, you overcome the world through your faith. It's supposed to happen sort of automatically. But how do we grow our faith to handle the crisis that we are in? How do we overcome? Well, it, I believe it comes out of relationship with Jesus. Time in the Word. Get filled up with the Word. Time in prayer. Praying with understanding and praying in tongues. That's why the baptism in the Holy Spirit is so important, so that um, we can pray in tongues and um, then look back. And one of the advantages of being older is you've got more things to look back on. You know, you, you weren't born 18 years ago, you were born 81 years ago. So I, when I look back, I, I begin to say, Lord, it's grace upon grace upon grace that you've been good to me yesterday, You've been good to me. You are being good to me today as I have this wonderful opportunity to preach and tomorrow and thereon, you will be the same because you don't change at all. You will be good. You will be good. Believe that when the Lord quickens a scripture, we call it, gives you a rhema word, gives you, a, you look up a scripture and you see it's a promise to you. That helps your faith to grow because your father is speaking to you personally amongst seven billion people. It's phenomenal. Just one example I want to give you of a rhema word. It was my practice some years ago on the 1st of January to say, Lord, uh, would you like to give me a scripture for the coming year? And uh, this was what he gave me one year. It's Isaiah 41 verse 10, which says, uh, I've got the thing in the wrong place, but never mind. Do not fear, 
for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And I was so excited about that. Um, but I, 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 I didn't realize until the end of the year, when I had been through a whole lot of stuff that I didn't need to go through, he was telling me at the beginning of the year um, not to fear, don't be anxious, he'll do it, he will strengthen me, he will uphold me. So um, then the problems came through the year, but I could come back to this word and say, thank you, Lord, you've shown me that um, you are the God that's going to help me go right the way through. Verse 5 says, who is the one who overcomes the world? And the answer is one who believes Jesus is the Son of God. And that's become like such a rock. The more I learn about Jesus, the more I am sure. Anybody who says, I'm not sure if Jesus is the Son of God, doesn't know enough. There are 39 prophecies that were prophesied hundreds of years before Jesus came, starting with his birth, right through to his resurrection, which he could not have organized himself. No human being could, could do that. He is the Son of God. Okay? And then what, as I continued to read there, I was so interested to, to just see what, what else was coming on there. Um, in verse 6 it says, This is the one. Which one are we talking about? The Son of God who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with water only, but with the water and with the blood. And then verse 7, And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is the truth. And verse 8, For there are three that bear witness, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. So what is that saying to us is Jesus' baptism in water uh, the Father spoke from heaven, the, um, the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove, and that settled for me forever that we need to get baptized in water as a believer. There's no other variations whatsoever. And then, of course, Jesus said he would be going away, but he would send the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And um, Jesus is the one who baptizes us soaks us in the Holy Spirit. Wow! So, um, I want to ask the question this morning. We're talking about overcoming in a time of crisis. How is your relationship with the Holy Spirit? This is a burden on my heart these days that um, uh, somehow it seems to me the Holy Spirit is not understood at all or He's kind of kept at a distance and um, we need to know we need to know more and more about the Holy Spirit. So John 16 and verse 13, I'm going back to that same chapter, says, "But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, what will he do? He will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. He shall glorify me, Jesus is speaking, for he shall take of mine and shall disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he, that's the Holy Spirit, takes of mine and will disclose it to you. And so, to sum that up, the Holy Spirit wants to bring us into more and more truth and lead us back to Jesus. It's not dividing the Trinity into three. It's, we, there's nobody on this earth can tell us, explain the Trinity. It's an impossibility. But I, I know it's true. I believe it's true. And um, so he will lead us back to Jesus. So, and um, Jesus and the Father do not get bent out of shape if we pray to the Holy Spirit or talk to the Holy Spirit. They are in a complete and wonderful unity. But the Holy Spirit wants to help you, partner with you, to become an overcomer. Wow! So I encourage you, get to know the Holy Spirit. Where do I start? 
You ask me where I start? I want to say to you, read John chapter 13 through to 17. Jesus is talking. He's, he's been with his disciples for three years about, and it must have been an incredible experience, but he's trying to tell them that I'm going away. Now, let's just think of someone you know who is such a special friend of yours and um, uh, yeah, maybe if we're talking about single people, this person is so special, I think I'm going to marry that person one day. But then somehow they start telling you, but I'm going away. Uh, now, this is not a good example. I can see it's not a good example. But anyway, uh, Jesus is saying he's going away. This relationship, as they've experienced for three and a half years, miracles, supernatural every day, incredible teachings, authority, etc., etc., is just going to, to stop. So he knows that he needs to tell, encourage them. And he says to them, um, I'm going to send you another helper. And that is so precious. That scripture of John 14 and verse 16, where Jesus is talking to his, his, uh, his disciples, and he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. And that scripture is so important for me for two reasons. The one is the word another is a carbon copy photostat exact, exact representation of Jesus. So if you have no problem with Jesus, you should not have a problem with the Holy Spirit. It, it's in, in the Greek word, it's one Greek word that I know. The Greek word says that it means exactly, exactly the same. No difference. Twins have got nothing on, on, on this at all. Because it's exactly right there. That he may be with you forever. I remember, I don't know what the issue was, but many years ago, um, I said, Lord, I wonder if I'll be able to, to continue to be a Christian all my life or something like that and, and whatever. But um, there are folks saying that the, the gifts will cease sometimes and all sorts of things. And I was saying, Holy Spirit, what, what is this all about? And, and he brought me back to the scripture that he will be with you forever. So um, that just settled it and peace came into my heart. And that was the end of that story. So um, I want to know, do you love, respect, and are not afraid of Jesus? I know what your answer will be if you are a um, believer, if you've got some kind of relationship with Jesus. You will say, no, of course I'm not afraid of Jesus. I suspect that when you talk about the Holy Spirit, some people get a speed wobble. They, 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 there's some fear there. And I've put it down to in the past that that one translation of the Bible talks about the Holy Ghost. And we don't like ghosts. Nobody likes ghosts. Now, I don't know why that's in that Bible. And of course, some people think this is the only translation and there shouldn't be any other. But um, so um, I, I've, I've um, got growing more and more into the situation when I start my day, I have a quiet time. I've always had a quiet time. But now I start and, and I say, Holy Spirit, I'm not going to talk English. I know you understand English, but I'm going to talk in the language you gave me. So I spend a few minutes, maybe two minutes, maybe five minutes, just praying in, in, uh, in tongues. And then I start to get thoughts which I never thought of earlier on in the day or dreamt about that night. And so um, I, um, I try to respond. Sometimes a scripture comes into my mind or it's somebody that I need to contact in that day. So um, I, um, but I want to say this just to try and help some folks who might still be a bit worried that the Holy Spirit's going to, to grab hold of them and, and make them uh, shout in tongues or prophesy to their boss or something and get, I think they might get fired or something ridiculous like that. He's not going to do that. When you learn how to partner with the Holy Spirit, you'll know if you have to go and speak in tongues to your boss 
because at that time, that's what he needs. As long as it's the Holy Spirit that's told you, not that you think you'll give him a fright or uh, whatever. So um, it's um, everything I read about the Holy Spirit in the Word of God and everything I experience from the Holy Spirit, I want to say to you, it's always positive, inspiring, upbuilding. And if there's a bit of correction that needs to come in there, which will happen, it's done in such a gracious, sweet way, you cannot but help saying, oh, I'm sorry, Holy Spirit, that, that I did this or that, or I didn't forgot to do that, or whatever. And, and, and you feel his acceptance of, of your uh, asking him for forgiveness. And so um, it's, just, it's just so wonderful to have this kind of relationship with the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm just going to, in a sense, read one or two more scriptures about the Holy Spirit as well. And I want to go to Romans. And um, some people think that Romans is, um, you know, a theological type book and all that. And it's uh, Paul's teaching us about all sorts of things, which it is. But um, when you get on a bit in Romans, he, he says some very nice things that I just love about the Holy Spirit. For all, He has one. Romans 14 and verse 17. And this is another favorite scripture of mine. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And the next verse says, For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So um, it's not about eating and drinking, it's but about righteousness. When you know that you have right standing in other words, you are now part of God's family, you're a son or a daughter, then I believe peace and joy from the Holy Spirit comes into your life. And I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about, when I talk about peace, I'm talking about something supernatural. Jesus himself said, my peace I give to you, my peace I, live with, I leave with you. I'm going away and that's a supernatural peace. In spite of what's happening in the world, in spite of what's happening in, the, in South Africa, I live in peace. I'm not anxious about anything. And then um, I've seen the joy of the Holy Spirit in other people in different ways to me. Now some people in the past, and uh, things seem to have calmed down a bit, but um, people would fall off their chairs, uh, uh, they, they would uh, roll on the floor and they would um, laugh like you were tickling them loudly. But I, there's another kind of joy. In the midst of any circumstance, any crisis, there's another kind of joy. It's the joy of the Holy Spirit. It's a bubbling inside, even though the circumstances surrounding you are absolutely terrible. Very recently, a very special brother in the congregation, a leader in the congregation, died. The whole church was praying for him. But um, what happened was um, his wife at one stage shared after he died that she couldn't understand it. She had a, she had a joy inside of her which was bubbling up. This is the wife, although she was kind of grieving on the outside. That is the joy of the Holy Spirit. And you know, sometimes you just sit with a scripture and you, you just don't um, take it any further. And I thought, you know, let me look up some cross-references to the scripture. And in the very next chapter, it says, Now may the God of hope, our God is a God of hope. You're in crisis, you don't see the way out. The word says, I will make a way where there seems to be no way. And I will not allow you to be, to be distressed or whatever beyond which that you can handle. I will come and comfort. But he says, now may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace again in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Folks, we, we've just got to get to know the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're not talking about the world's kind of power. We're talking about God kind of power. And that is just something absolutely incredible. And then I think um, in the same chapter, um, Paul is, of course, writing, and he, said, he says, For I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentile, Gentiles by word and deed, in the power of signs and wonder, and listen to this, in the power of the Holy Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and round about as far as Lyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And um, folks, if you could, I've meditated and thought about the, um, what it was like in those days. You didn't climb on an airplane and go anywhere, you walked. And if it only was 100 k's away, it might have taken you five days to get there. You didn't, you had the Old Testament. You did not have the New Testament. But Paul, in the power of the Spirit, was mightily used by God. After Jesus, Paul is the number one or the first Christian in the world by far. But, so, um, then, um, while I was looking at this, um, I had written on a scrap of paper, you make notes and you write something down and then you see if it fits in or not. But then I came across this scripture, uh, which I had forgotten, but I must give it to you. Uh, Romans 8 and verse 37. But in all these things, the things that are happening to you, we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. Those words, overwhelmingly conquer. We didn't just slide, you know, it's like a, a game of rugby or something like that, where you win by 32 points to 31. This is not, there was a rugby game recently where the one team won by 102 points to zero, which, which is an absolute disaster for the losing team. So I'm going to go back to this scripture in Romans 8.37 where it says, But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. And I'm going to read it in different translations. I'm going to read the cross-references and see where it goes. I can't wait to get into that. So, um, you know, I need to say to you, the more we get to know, trust and obey the Holy Spirit, the supernatural becomes natural in our everyday life. And I just need to say the supernatural is not you going necessarily to stand on a street corner and start uh, uh, preaching the word. It's not going into the hospital asking to see the CEO of the hospital and say, look, I've come to work through the wards. I am now going to pray for everybody. I'm going to empty this hospital of all your patients because my God is going to heal this this has happened, by the way, in the world many years ago, John G. Lake Ministries. But anyway, um, you can wake up in the morning and you're thinking about the day, going to work, and you suddenly think about someone you hadn't thought of for a while. And you decide, I think the Holy Spirit wants me to ring them up. You ring them up, and while the phone is ringing, Maybe a scripture comes into your mind and the person answers and you say, you know, I woke up this morning and I started thinking about you and I thought I must phone you and see how you're getting on. And while the phone was ringing, I, I had the scripture which I want to give to you. And that thing was so spot on for that person that day at that moment. That's supernatural. You couldn't have thought and chosen, ah, I need that scripture for that person at this time. No, no, that's the Holy Spirit. And that's what makes Christianity so exciting. When you try to follow and learn to follow the Holy Spirit, you, you, you have an exciting life. Okay? And so, but let me just finish up and be very, try and be very practical. When we experience a crisis or a tragedy, how do we handle it? We can battle through it on our own, and if we have no relationships with people, if we're one of those people who doesn't need anybody else in my life, then um, 
you are in serious trouble. Or you can blame God and turn away from Him. And I'm sure it's not God's fault. Or, and this is the only way to go, you can turn to God and say, I'm in this crisis, I'm in this tragedy, I don't know what to do next. Help! I need your comfort and I need your direction. And then I added, right just before I came down to the church to preach, I had another thought, which I thank you, Holy Spirit, that when we turn to God, let's involve the people that we have relationships with. Let's, let's get prayer support so that um, they can help us in the situation. I'm reminded of a family member on my wife's side, twice removed or something, I've met them. Lovely couple, this husband suddenly got um, COVID, went into hospital, and, and as happened in many tragic t cases, people thought he would come out a few days later, he died. His wife was left behind. We did not know that, they, we, did, we, we couldn't think of anybody that they knew. And um, uh, we've only found out later that um, they were living in a complex and um, someone in the complex, one person in the complex felt uh, when she heard that she, you know, these stories get around, that she lost her husband, she went to her and that was God's messenger to support and help her. But one got the impression that the two of them lived together, very nice people, um, but um, not much, don't go to church, don't have any church relationships, and when the husband died, she was left all alone. Remember I said earlier on, Jesus said before the cross, I am not alone. Everybody else has left me, but Father, you are with me. Hallelujah. So um, we need to be able to say, um, Holy Spirit, take me to Jesus. Take me to Father God. I need, I need you right now. Be everything to me that I need right now. Remember, as I come to a place of closing, remember the name of the Holy Spirit is the one who comes alongside to help. Surely we need to make the Holy Spirit a priority in our lives. Now, as I would suggest, as I commented earlier, here's some homework if you'd like some homework. And I suggest you read Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. In every situation of the word to the churches, it, it says, He who overcomes, I will. So there are rewards for those who overcome. But just to take the work the word overcome as well and trace it through the word and the and the other words like conquer and that sort of thing. And um, I want to finish up and say that the Holy Spirit is the life of Jesus operating on earth in 2021 for you and me if we will just do something about that relationship. Thank you for the time, chance of sharing with you. And um, I just want to finish off what I'm saying by praying a short prayer. Father, I don't know who this word this morning is specifically for, but I'm convinced in my mind that there are those that need to hear this word and they need to respond to the word like the man who built his house on a rock. He heard the word and he did the word, not the, like the one who built his house on the sand who heard the word and did nothing about it and he lost everything. And so, Father, I, I just know that your spirit is so precious, so wonderful. And um, I pray that for those even who are a little bit scared of the Holy Spirit, from today will change. And you, Holy Spirit, in fact, will creep up on them, if I can put it that way, and encourage them to get to know you. That their lives may change completely and they will overcome in any crisis or any tragedy that the devil tries to throw at them. The devil does not have the last word in anything. Although I've mentioned his name for the first time at the end of this preach, he has no authority 
except if we give it to him. And I must stop now before I go off on a whole thing about the authority of the believer. God bless you and share this. If it's helped you, share it with someone else. Amen. Amen.